Hello, sisters of the Rolling Hills Ward. I am uh, Rebecca Piper Besselberg. There are several new sisters in the ward that we haven't yet had the opportunity to um, physically meet, and I'm grateful for the Zoom meeting to meet the Everhearts this morning. And um, welcome to the ward. Um, we have several several new sisters, and as we are able to go through the neighborhoods, we can greet and meet one another. Um, I had been asked by Sheridan to give um, my thoughts on the, the talk of Elder James R. Rasband, Ensuring a Righteous Judgment. It's found in the Saturday morning session of um, last October, no, of April, sorry, April conference um, twenty. 2020 of this year. Um, I When conference came last year in April when we were listening, I was struck um, while we were listening and taking, and I was taking notes how profoundly I was struck by this talk and that I wanted to go back and study it. And here I have the opportunity to give a few of my thoughts on, um, on this talk and my experiences as well. Um, he starts out the talk by quoting President Nelson from October conference of 2019 when in his closing remarks saying um, that this April conference was going to be unforgettable and um, also he went through um, different points of temple work and other things and one of his questions he asked was as we read the Book of Mormon a possible question that we could ask is what what would our how would our lives be if the knowledge that we gained from the Book of Mormon were suddenly taken away. And Elder Rasband in, in his talk says that thought struck me profoundly and I thought about it for a long time. And, um, and the thought that's come again and again was without the Book of Mormon and its clarity about the doctrine of Christ and his atoning sacrifice, where would I turn for peace? I think that's a really profound thought, especially since this was this last April conference was unforgettable and completely not conventional with no meetings. I mean, no meeting in person and only the few that were talking for that morning were in attendance. Um, and it certainly the sound quality was different. A lot of things were different. We didn't have live music. We couldn't meet as congregations or as extended larger families. We met and we were in um, quor not quarantine, but we were certainly um, social distancing by remaining in our homes. Um, and it was, it's been a profound change in our lives of how we have been able to study the restoration, to read the Come Follow Me, to think about and ponder what would our lives be like if we didn't have the Book of Mormon. Well, Elder Rasband gives a fabulous discourse on this and um, I'm going to share a few of my thoughts and a few of my ponderings that I've had as I've studied this talk and as also I've studied other gospel principles and, 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 and thoughts that come from Come Follow Me and also from our family home reunion lessons. Um, I have found in my own life that the study um, of the doctrine of Christ has helped me to change and to become a better person that has been profound in in helping me to understand other things that I have studied, but truly it's the doctrine of Christ that has helped me to change. Um, I, I was teaching a family home evening lesson uh, the other week, and it was just in this, you know, the book, um, the family home evening manual, and you can either get it digitally, or I still have one, a hard copy, but it's under the topics of building a strong family, and it's the, it's the yellow section on the inside. But helping family members live the gospel. And I was struck with this. Sometimes we think that some five-second formula or recipe will effectively change a family member's behavior. Long-term change, however, comes only from living correct principles. And I was struck, and, the, and it was a, a short... A short um, little excerpt and then it goes on to talk about the Lord's way and Satan's um, way and but this goes hand in hand with what Elder Rasband is is trying to teach us that we do we often look in our lives for short for some short term fix 
for a much larger problem. And as we study the doctrine of Christ, we, in our, in our desire to become like him, we change and our behavior changes. And I have been on a journey for years to understand um, good emotional and mental behavior. And um, I've studied and, you know, off and on and have taken courses and classes and um, brought back to, this is one of the first things from the addiction recovery program. The first step is honesty and Elder Boy K. Packer, or President Boy K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve taught, the study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. And then he goes on to say, preoccupation with unworthy behavior can lead to unworthy behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. And that's in conference report, October 1986. That, that quote has struck me profoundly, and Elder Rasband really elaborates on this idea of, without the Book of Mormon, how could we find peace? Without the doctrine of Christ, without the atonement, and we understand so much more beautifully and simply the atonement through the Book of Mormon, and that truly is what helps us to become new creatures in in Christ and to change behavior. Um, he he talks about that the doctrine of Christ, which consists of the saving principles and ordinances of the faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. These are all Sunday school answers, simple primary answer, answers is taught numerous times in the scriptures of the Restoration, but with particular power in the Book of Mormon. The doctrine begins with faith in Christ, and every one of its elements depends upon trust in that atoning, in his atoning sacrifice. He quotes President Nelson teaching, The Book of Mormon provides the fullest and most authoritative understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ to be found anywhere, unquote. And this is what I understand from everything that I have studied in, in change, in behavior, in emotions, in, in, in doing good emotional work, that the more we understand about the Savior's supernal gift, the more we will come to know in our minds, in our hearts, the reality of President Nelson's assurance that the truths of the Book of Mormon have the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls powerful, powerful worlds. Who doesn't, who doesn't want to be suckered or consoled or cheered or to have the ability to, to help others on this journey? And I love it. He, he breaks this talk into five elements. The first, the Book of Mormon teaches the doctrine of Christ. And truly, sisters, in all the work that I have done, it truly has been the Book of Mormon that has taught me more and solidified more my testimony and what the atonement is and how it can help me to be a better person. And that truly has been one of my very best counselors is the reading and the praying and the pondering. The, sa the second point is the Savior's atonement satisf satisfies all the demands of justice. The third point, the Savior heals the wounds we cannot heal. What a powerful idea. The Savior's sacrifice ensures a righteous judgment, and the last, the Savior will mend all that we have broken. In the Savior's atonement satisfies all the demands of justice. Um, we understand the understanding of the Savior's atonement is its teaching that Christ's merciful sacrifice fulfills all the demands of justice. As Alma explained, God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God, that God might be perfect. Just be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. The Father's plan of mercy um, and what the scriptures also call uh, the plan of happiness or the plan of salvation could not be accomplished until all the demands of justice were satisfied. And in some ways, this reminds me of the, the talk that uh, the thoughts I gave on um, Dallin H. Oaks, The Great Plan. The, the, the beauty and the ability to understand this plan truly is what gives us peace, hope, the ability to endure to the end. And not only that, but to heal us and to heal others. 
is truly remarkable. Um, he asks the question, but what exactly are the demands of justice? And we have this beautiful story of Alma in the Book of Mormon. Not only do we see a man in struggle, we see a man who has sinned against the church, sinned against what he, what his, um, uh, is, uh, we have Alma the, the older and Alma the younger's experience. Um, uh, Alma's, and this is mainly the story he's talking about is Alma the younger, that Alma went about seeking, seek, and his youth went about seeking to destroy the church. And in fact, later we get little bits of his story. We don't get it all in one time. We have to read consecutively and, and through the Book of Mormon to glean. And later in, um, he tells his son Helaman that he was tormented with the pains of hell because he had effectively murdered many of the God's children by leading them away unto destruction. This is poignant because I don't know that many of us have felt, felt that, but we certainly have felt the times in our lives when we have, have not done things with the Spirit or have done things where we have regretted or we have led people to do things that were not uh, conducive or, or allowing the Spirit to be there. And, and, and we have all felt times in turmoil or struggle or shame or guilt or knowing that we haven't done things correctly. And that's why Alma the Younger story is so powerful to me is to know that we can change, we can become sanctified, we can become whole in, in, in our journey. Um, and then later Alma explained to Helaman that peace finally came when his mind caught upon mind caught hold on his father's teachings concerning the coming of Jesus Christ to atone for the sins of the world. And then a penitent Alma ple pleaded for Christ's mercy and then felt joy and relief when he realized that Christ had atoned for his sins and paid all that justice required. And... Um, I think that, and then later he says, thus part of Alma's relief must have been that unless mercy interceded, justice would have prevented him from returning to live with Heavenly Father. I have, I have felt that. I have felt the pains and the remorse and, and the struggle, and I've also felt the peace and, and, and the leaning and receiving and feeling the healing gift of the atonement in my life. Um, the Savior heals the wounds that we cannot heal. I loved how Brother Elder Asman says, but was Alma's joy focused solely on himself, on his avoiding punishment, and his being able to return to the Father? Certainly we have all felt that those pains of guilt or knowing when we have made a mistake and we just can't make it right. But that joy that comes from uh, that our joy isn't full, full unless we know that other people have, have, are feeling that way. And he says, we know that Alma also agonized about those whom he had led away from the truth. But Alma himself could not heal and restore all those he had led away. He could not himself ensure, and this is again, ensuring a righteous judgment, that they would be given a fair opportunity to learn the doctrine of Christ and to be blessed by living its joyful principles. He could not bring back those who, had, who may have died still blinded by his false teaching. And at Elder Packer, here's another quote. It's that President Boy K. Packer once taught, the thought that rescued Alma is this, restoring what you cannot restore, healing the wound you cannot heal, fixing that which you broke and you cannot fix is the very purpose of the atonement of Christ. The joyous truth on which Alma's mind caught hold was not just that he himself could be made clean, but also that those whom he had harmed could be healed and made whole. I know that I have been concerned about that. I have wondered, I have also struggled with being the recipient of other people's mistakes and knowing that I can be made whole through the atonement of Jesus Christ and that other people can be made whole because of the potential mistakes that I have made or not potential, the mistakes that I have made is peaceful. It's peaceful to know that we all 
can participate in the atonement if we choose to. And even those who didn't have the opportunity will have the opportunity in the next life or in the uh, after we die we'll have the opportunity to still hear the gospel of Jesus Christ um, he reassures us that even before Alma's experience as King Benjamin taught these doctrines King Benjamin had taught about the breadth of healing offered by the Savior's atoning sacrifice. King Benjamin declared that glad tidings of great joy were given him by an angel from God. We sing tidings of great joy Christmas time when we know that Christ is born, that he has come to save and to redeem his people. Among those glad tidings was the truth that Christ would suffer and die for our sins and mistakes to ensure that a righteous judgment might come upon the children of men. There's a beautiful footnote in here, um, and I encourage you to read them. There's one about, from Joseph Smith. There's several from Boykie Packer, um, and this isn't one of them, but that we, and um, that a righteous judgment will come upon us. And what exactly does a righteous judgment require? In the next verse, King Benjamin explained that no, to, to ensure a righteous judgment, the Savior's blood atoned for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam and for those who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them or who have ignorantly sinned. Um, and that was with lots of scriptures. A righteous judgment also required, he taught, that the blood of Christ atoneth for the sins of little children so that these scriptures teach a glorious doctrine the Savior's atoning sacrifice heals as a free gift those who sin in ignorance, those to whom, as Jacob put it, there is no law given. Accountability for sin depends on the light we have been given and hinges on our ability to exercise our agency. We know this healing and comforting truth only because of the Book of Mormon and other restoration scripture. This is a beautiful quote from, um, I'll read this, from... Um, Joseph Smith, and this is in footnote 24, elaborating on the doctrine of the baptism for the dead, the prophet Joseph once said, while one portion of the human race is judging and condemning the other without mercy, the great parent of the universe looks upon the whole of the human family with a fatherly care and a paternal regard. Isn't that comforting <laughs> to know that there is a heavenly father who wants to extend as much mercy and love as possible? Then Finishing the quote, he views them as his offspring. He is a wise lawgiver and will judge all men, not according to the narrow contracted notions of man of men. He will judge them not according to what they have not, but according to what they have, meaning that we can't be judged if we didn't know or if we didn't have the opportunity to hear it. Those who have lived without the law will be judged without law, and those who have a law will be judged by that law. We need not doubt the wisdom and intelligence of the great Jehovah. He will award judgment or mercy to all nations according to their several deserts, deserts, their means of obtaining intelligence, the laws by which they are governed, the facilities afforded them of obtaining correct information, and we shall all of us eventually, eventually have to confess that the judge of all the earth has done right. Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith, um, page 404. I love that. I love that the, that the Father of us is willing to extend mercy, and so is the great Jehovah, who atoned and sacrificed for us and provided this atonement so that we can feel heal, healed and peace. Um, And of course, we understand where there is a law given, we are not ignorant of the will of God, but we will be accountable. Um, that's what makes it so hard as we're reading the Book of Mormon, the Nephites that sin against the, the greater light, who should, who know and still turn against that. Um, this too... Uh, not only does the, and then Elder Rasmus said, not only does the Savior heal and restore those who sin in ignorance, but also for those who sin against the light, the Savior offers healing on the condition of repentance and faith in him. Even sisters, when we sin against the light, and we do, 
We all of us do. We all of us make mistakes. We all of us struggle with mortality in this finite sphere. We all of us, though, if we humble ourselves and repent and act in faith and try to do what is right and try to restore that which has been broken, there is healing for us. There is, there, we can be restored. Um, Alma must have caught hold of both of these truths. Would Alma truly have felt what he described as exquisite joy if he thought that Christ saved him but left forever harmed those he had led away from the truth? Surely not. For Alma to feel complete peace, those he harmed also needed the opportunity to be made whole. I have felt that truth in my life. I have felt that I am not completely whole when I know there is someone I have been harmed, I have hurt. And until I try to make that right, I don't feel whole. But then he says, but how exactly would they or those we may harm be made whole? Although we do not fully understand the sacred mechanics by which the Savior's atoning sacrifice heals and restores, we do know that to ensure a righteous judgment, the Savior will clear away the underbrush of ignorance and the painful thorns of hurt caused by others. By this, he ensures that all God's children will be given the opportunity with unobscured vision to choose to follow him and accept the great plan of happiness. And there's another beautiful footnote, number 28. This comes from D. Todd Christofferson, Redemption, May 2013. Um, he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people, and he will take upon them their infirmities. Isaiah 53, 3-5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows. Isaiah 61, 1-3. The Lord hath anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. It is instructive that the Savior quoted from these verses in Isaiah when he announced his Messiahship. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. We have scriptures and beautiful prophecies of what the Savior who he who he was before he was born and what he was what he did to come to fulfill that mission and how he fulfilled it not only do we have a record of it in the bible the old testament and the new testament but we also have it in the book of mormon and a powerful another testament of jesus christ to teach us of this valuable saving ordinance not just for us but for everyone who chooses to live in the atonement. I loved this last thing, the Savior will mend all that we have broken. It is these truths that will that would have brought Alma peace, and it is these truths that would bring us great peace as well. As natural men and women, we all bump or sometimes crash into each other and cause harm. As any parent can testify, the pain associated with our mistakes is not simply the fear of our own punishment, but the fear that we may have <clears throat> limited our children's joy or in some way hindered them from seeing and understanding the truth. The glorious promise of the Savior's atoning sacrifice is that as far as our mistakes as parents are concerned, he holds our children blameless and promises healing for them. And even when they have sinned against the light, as we all do, his arm of mercy is outstretched and he will redeem them if they will but look to him and live. Although the Savior has power to mend what we cannot fix, he commands us to do all we can to make restitution as part of our repentance. Our sins and mistakes displace not only our relationship with God, but also our relationships with others. Sometimes our efforts to heal and restore may be as simple as an apology, but other times restitution may require years of humble effort. Yet many of our sins and mistakes, we simply are not able to fully heal those we have hurt. The magnificent peace-giving promise of the Book of Mormon and the restored gospel is that the Savior will mend all that we have broken. And he will also mend us if we turn to him in faith and repent of the harm we have caused. He offers both of these gifts because he loves all of us with perfect love. 
and because he is committed to ensuring a righteous judgment that honors both justice and mercy. I felt such peace when I heard this talk first. One, because I, I have been broken and I know that I have hurt others in ways that they may be broken too and to know and to have this so beautifully pondered for so long and beautifully written. Um, Elder Rasband was a lawyer and taught at BYU and then went into the, um, academics and was called to be a, a 70 out of, he was vice president for BYU. But all of his years in law and teaching law to give this profound sermon on ensuring a righteous judgment I am so grateful for his ability to ponder and to understand the atonement so that we can understand it better. I testify that these things are true. I testify that we can be made whole, that those that we have bumped into or crashed into can be made whole too through implementing the doctrine of Christ. It's found in the Book of Mormon, found wholly in the Book. I mean, there's a whole version. We find it through other scriptures and certainly through other restored um, teachings and certainly through our general authorities who ponder and think on these things and give discourses for us to think on. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share my thoughts and my feelings and my testimony with you. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.